got your Bibles, turn to Jude. It's just got one chapter. We started last week. We talked last week on, we just went through those verses, uh, verse 20, 21, 22, and 23, and we talked about five principles for survival and strength. And I told you that I was going to start a series. Now, let me ask you something. You're just, Jeremy came in, we just, All right. Okay. I don't need <laughs> it. didn't sound good. Uh, Brother Jeremy came in. We, we talk about, you know, help me, Lord. I'm taking this off, okay? It's making me nervous. Sit there. Come here, Chad. The devil wanting to fight this message, evidently. I don't know what's going on, so we'll try that one there. I'm not going to move anywhere, so. <laughs> but anyway, Jeremy came in. We were talking uh, a little bit. and Every once in a while, you know, in a church like this, and uh, we've got a great church. But over the years, unfortunately, you've seen some people come and you've seen some people go. And sometimes, and if it wasn't for, I guess, social media, you wouldn't know where they went. And sometimes I wish I wouldn't see social media or see that thing to see how they're doing. Somebody help me preach. And you wonder why so many people or in and out. I mean, why can't they just live for God? Somebody help me preach. I'm, I'm preaching about something that's real. And the next thing you know, they're out drinking, partying, living a lifestyle that's not right? And you wonder, what happened? In the next five weeks, and it may last longer than that, I'm going to show you why folks do go out. I personally believe they go out because they didn't get in. And if they did get in, they didn't do what they should have done to stay in. Does that make sense? I'm going, I'm, I'm, this will be a very pastoral type next five weeks, okay? But look at Jude, and I, this is just a launching point because I'm going to take you to several places. But let's look at Jude, verse 20, and try to examine that a little bit. The Bible said, but ye beloved, that's talking to believers, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, obviously he's saying that we need to build up on our faith, always yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, I'm glad I got someone that helps me in my prayers. Amen. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, what I am going to do for the next five weeks, and then I'm going to hop off and give you another uh, maybe five weeks, but I'm going to give you some basics. Building blocks of the faith. If we're going to be successful Christians, and have a, the right kind of house, we got to have the right kind of building blocks. Amen. Amen. Somebody help me preach. Amen. And I'm going to say this to you, there's a lot of folks that absolutely, evidently have not built up building blocks in their life because their life has crumbled. Now, I'm going to start off with the most important thing. Now, what did it say there? But ye beloved, are y'all with me? Building up yourselves on your most holy, what? 
faith. Now, what he's saying is, once you get saved, you build upon that. So what I'm going to do tonight, step by step, for tonight's message is entitled this, Salvation, the Assurance of Your Faith. If your foundation is not right, it is impossible to live a Christian life. You ever wonder why people can't or don't live a Christian life and they come in for a little while and then they're out and they make a profession then they're gone? You ever wonder? I, I, I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, there's a good likelihood that they never got the right foundation. And if you don't have the right foundation, you can't build on it. So what I'm going to do tonight, start there, okay? Uh, Dr. J.B. Gambrell in his book said this, conversion is the end of the Christian life. It's just the front end. Amen? Being saved is the starting point, not the stopping point. Salvation is where we get in, but there's a matter of going on. Somebody help me preach. Jude said it. He said, building up yourself on your most holy faith. Now, man, I've got a PowerPoint, Brother uh, uh, Josh Kim, we'll get to it in just a moment. But if you want to turn to this pa passage, why don't you turn to Hebrews 6.1. I, I just want you to look at this passage. I want to give you a couple passages I just want you to look at. Go to Hebrews 6.1. When you're there, say amen, amen real loud. Amen. That's real good. Hebrews 6.1. I love the book of Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on or let us go unto perfection. Look at me. Perfection is not sinless perfection. Perfection there is maturity or completeness. Why is it? And Paul dealt with the Corinthian church a lot about this. Why is it there's so many immature Christians? It's because they've never grown and they've never added to their faith. Somebody say amen. Now listen, it's therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That's a one-time deal. You got to go on from there. I say to you, people who are in and out of church and not stable is because they've never really got in. Amen. And if they got in, they haven't went forward in their Christian life. Is that good preaching? Amen. Now, do this for me. Turn to, I'm just going to give you a few places to turn, then I'll try to settle in. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 48 and 49. Just turn there. I'm this teaching preacher, this pastoral preaching tonight. When you're there, say amen. amen. I want you to follow me tonight. I'm going to take my time. The Bible said that this, this story in Luke is talking about two people and two foundations and two men. It says in the, Luke 6, it says, He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon what? Who is our rock? If you read Corinthians, it said that rock is Christ. Now notice the next verse. But he that heareth and doeth it not is like a man that 
without a foundation built a house upon the earth and against which the stream did beat vehemently and, and immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. Ladies and gentlemen, it's just, you want to know why there's so many casualties in the Christian life and we see so many people come and going? It's because they never built on the right foundation. This may sound basic and it may sound simplistic, but if you don't have your foundation built on Christ, there's no way you can live a Christian life and no way you can do right for God and you'll constantly go in and out of sin. Good preacher. Let me give you another verse. I want you to see it. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.11. I'm I'm moving. I'll give you the outline in a moment. So what is the foundation, Lois? 1 Corinthians 3.11. When you're there, say amen. amen. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So when I say building blocks and building upon your most holy faith, I am talking about building upon Christ Jesus, upon this rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now, I'm going to give you three things today, and then we'll go home here in just a moment, about this thing of salvation and the assurance of your faith. I want you now, get my PowerPoint up uh, please, and go to point number one. Are we there? There we are. The examination of our salvation. Now, I hope you can see that. If you can't, go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. That's where I want you to go. Why would Paul say this to the Corinthian people? Examine yourselves. Now, Lois, that's not for me to say, well, I'm going to take a look at Lois and see what kind of Christian she is or is she really saved. It's not what it's saying. Our problem is we're trying to look at everybody else instead of looking at ourselves. Somebody help me preach. He said, examine yourselves. Now, listen to what he says. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be a reprobate. Is that strong? Some fundamentalists give Billy Graham a hard time. I won't do that tonight. I remember in the 50s when I was a boy and heard him preach. But I'll tell you what he said. This was Billy Graham's quote. He said, one of the largest mission fields in the world is right in the local New Testament church. He said that. O.S. Hawkins in his book, Getting Down to Brass Tacks, made a similar statement. He said, one of the greatest evangelistic uh, harvest fields in America just might be the people on the church roads. I say amen. There's a lot of people that have their name on church rolls that have never been saved. It's a fact. Let me give you three things under this point. First of all, you need to prove the validity of our claim. Examine yourselves. I asked Chad today, I said, Chad, what does it mean to examine ourselves? And he said it correctly. He said it means to test or scrutinize. Paul was telling the believers in Corinth, he said, you need to put your faith to a test and you need to look at it and scrutinize it to see if you're really in. If he said that, 
then there must be the, a possibility of folks not being really in. Am I preaching? Notice in verse 5 also it said, boy, look at this strong stuff here. It said, unless it be reprobates. You know what that word reprobate means? The word speaks of those who have failed the test and have been discredited. They got a failing grade. Why is there so much superficial Christianity? Why is there so many fakes? Why is there so many people living a double standard? It's simple. They've never really trusted Christ and got him as their foundation. And obviously people can be fooled or Paul wouldn't say, examine yourselves. Amen. Then secondly, we need to present the the validity of our claim. He said in verse five, prove your own selves. Man. <laughs> I'm not to prove, I'm not to say, hey, Lance is saved, you prove you're saved. There's only one, I, I know that there's only one person I know for sure saved in this room and that's me because I'm the only one who can know that. And I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to judge somebody and say they're lost when they, it ain't my job to judge them. But you ought to look at your own self. And you can't be deceived. Oh, good preaching. See, I, I believe this salvation is a little bit like measles. If you got it, it's going to leap out all over you. Then thirdly, under this point, possess the validity of our claim. Listen to what it says. Paul said, know ye not your own selves. That word know stresses a thorough understanding of oneself. Are you saved? Are you living a consistent Christian life? Do you know you're saved? Is there evidence? Good preacher, Reverend. Let me ask you this. If they took you to court, would they have enough evidence to find you guilty of being saved? And we wonder, what, what happens to these people? Has the church failed? Has Christ failed? No. God never fails. The gospel never fails. But if they never got really saved, there's the failure. That's what we're getting right now. We're heavy duty in, in uh, discipleship. I look back, I think Jada is back there. Jada went through, you went through what, 18 weeks or so of discipleship in Pastor Chad's office. And uh, Pastor Josh is discipling people right now in his office. Is that not correct, you and your wife? And we're trying our best to not only get people saved, but disciple them, make sure they got it. Am I preaching? I think if there's a failure of the local church today, here's the failure. We, we get people saved, but we don't disciple them well enough, and we don't make sure they got it. And if you could go 18 weeks with somebody and take a book with them, I guarantee before the 18 weeks is over, you'd know if they're saved or not. Number two, let's go to the experience of our salvation. On the most holy faith, the experience of our salvation. There's a lot of people that's plagued with doubt. And let me give you two questions about your experience. That's all I want to ask you. Number one, is your experience based upon the Word of God? It's not based on, hey, uh, you come down here to the altar and I say, oh, you're okay. No, no, no. It's your experience based upon the Word of God. 
First of all, did you come under conviction? Do you see yourself a sinner? Do you see yourself lost? Did you understand what the gospel was? 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Did you understand you need to repent of your sin? That means turn from it and turn to Christ. Is it based on the word of God or is it based on feeling? I want to tell you, sometimes I don't feel saved. I'll be honest with you, this last 12 weeks of this, of this surgery I had, I ain't felt very good at all. But I want you to know something. Feelings come and feelings go, but the word of God standeth forever. And if your salvation is built on the word of God, it stands. Amen. 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 Ain't nothing can shake the Bible. The devil comes to you and whispers in your ear, are you saved? Really? What are you base it on? I'll tell you what I tell the devil. I base it on the word of God. I base it on that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Devil, I've done that. Devil, I've done that. we got to base it on the, the word of God. That's why I pound the gospel. And it, it, it isn't grace plus speaking in tongues. It ain't grace plus baptism. It ain't grace plus good works. It ain't grace plus church membership. It is solely trusting Christ the Bible way. Amen. What's well, good? By the way, if you haven't really been saved and your salvation isn't rooted in the word of God, you're going to doubt and you're not going to be able to live a Christian life because you're not really saved. And then you know what you're going to do? You're going to get frustrated and then you'll get out of church. Am I helping you? All right, let me go on. Number second question I want to ask you this. This is good. Is your experience based on the work of Christ? The Bible said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you're in this room and you've never believed on the Son and you've never trusted the Son, the wrath of God is resting on you right now, whether you're a church member or not. Good preacher. Oh, preacher, I've been baptized. This young lady, Tori, right? She uh, had a profession when you was younger. Then you got it real when you was 19. And when you got disciples, you saw that, that you were supposed to be baptized after you are saved. And that's why you followed the Lord and believed his baptism, baptism a few weeks ago. Is that not correct? Somebody help me preach. What? <laughs> Baptism does, church membership doesn't save you. Right. Well, I'm a member of the T rally, that independent, fundamental, independent, fundamental, single rap. You can be a member of every church in this valley and go to hell. This, the, the work of salvation is not church, that comes after you're saved. And we'll get to that later on in this study. Well, preacher, I used to be a deacon. I used to be a Sunday school. That, that don't count. Is it based on Christ? Now, lastly, I'll spend the most of my time here. And I want you to spend it with me. The evidence of our salvation. That's what I want to deal with. Oh, we're going to get deep. We're going to get down to where the rubber meets the road right now. Amen. Look with me at James two seventeen. It ought to be up on the board, is it? But get you go ahead and get in your Bible and look at it. Even so, 
faith. If it hath not works, is what? Being alone. James is not saying that faith and works together save a person. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if your faith hath no works and the absence of works reveals that your faith dead. James 2, 18 says this, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. The key words are, I'll show thee my faith by my works. God sees faith, Chad. But the only way I can know if you're saved, even think you're saved, is if you have works or not. Good preaching, Reverend. Now, let me give you two things here under this. And would you go again? It should be on your PowerPoint. Uh, there is, there's an evidence of my life. And try to get that up. First John 2, 3 through 6. If you want to go there, you can, or if you can read the PowerPoint. But I like for you to just get in the Bible. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, and in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. And he, he that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so walk, even as he walked. John was saying that my walk and talk ought to be the same. A lot of people talk a good game. But they don't walk one. Amen. The word keep there was a sailor's word. It spoke of, a, of the sailors navigating by the stars. The stars were their guides. As the sailor set his course by the stars, he, he, he was said to be keeping the stars. Well, I want you to know the word of God is our guide. Somebody help me preach. It is, it is what leads us in our Christian life. And if we don't have no desire for God's word, I wonder if, we got, if we've really been saved. Now, I want to give you a, a second evidence. And I'm going to really take some time here. There's the evidence of my love. Boy, this is... Remember last week we talked about keep yourself in the love of God? 1 John 3, 14. It's on the board, but if you want to look in your Bible, I'd really like for you to look at this carefully. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love what? Now look at the last part of that. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Whew. How in the world? And we say we're saved and have the love of God in us and have a hatred toward our brother. There's a people I know that have acted very foolishly for their life and I dislike the way they are. I do. And I don't like the influence they've been on people. However, I still love them, and I pray for them. I want you to know something. One of the biggest tests of your Christian life is knowing that you're really saved is that you love your brother. Can you forgive? Boy, that's good preaching. I'll tell you what happened to me when I got saved. There was a guy that I worked with that I absolutely detested. I mean, uh, this is not embellishing the story. He was a card-carrying communist. He was a communist. I remember he, he followed McGovern when back there when McGovern ran for president. He, this guy was a card-carrying communist. I couldn't stand him. 
And I said his name. Some of you know him because he got in politics. I know you would know him. And when I came to work on February the 1st, my boss, for whatever reason, put him in the, in the van with me for an all-day day trip. And I want you to know, I, I'm honest, because I, I wouldn't care to just say a few words to him anytime I saw him. I didn't like him. And he got in a van, and I called his name out. I said, uh, great day today, isn't it? I said, I'm going to tell you what happened to me last night. He said, what? I said, I got saved. And I said, I, you know what? I even love you this morning. <laughs> he said, you, you're one of my enemies here. You hate me. I said, no more. I don't hate you anymore. Man, I tell you what, there's a big tear got up in that old communist so that's eyeball. He was. He was a card carrying. He had it. Now, I didn't like what he was, but my whole attitude changed toward him when I got saved because I started wanting him saved. I started witnessing that boy. I started giving him gospel tracts. I started talking to him about the Lord. I never snubbed him again the rest of the time I worked with him. Don't tell me you love God, you don't love your neighbor. Don't tell me you love God, you don't love each other. Amen. <laughs> well, it's good preaching. It's kind of hard on me right now, but it's good preaching. The Bible says, he that hateth his brother murdereth his brother. And don't you know there ain't no murderers going to enter into the kingdom of God? See, let me ask you this. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's be transparent. Can you look at your life right now and look down in your life and you're able to prove you're saved and you know you're saved and there's no doubt that you're saved because it's based on the Bible and based on the work of Christ and you've got evidence because you work for God and you've got evidence you've got fruit. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I, it breaks my heart that there's some people who have come to this church and sometimes I felt like I failed early on, not discipled well enough. And I think we need to take a little bit of blame there. But I, I want you to know this. There's a lot of people who come in and out of the church that really never have been saved. And you know what's happened to our preachers? You know what's happened? The most Baptist preacher were scared to death to tell folks, examine yourself. We're afraid to say, was there a day you really repented of your sin? Was there a day you really turned from your sin and turned to Christ and there was a change in life? And we're afraid to preach that because we don't want to lose any dollars or any numbers. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to preach the Bible. Real repentance and real change. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to read one last verse. Turn to Matthew 7. Are you there? I'm almost, I'm done. I'm, I'm closing. I promise. Lord, let's get ready to go to invitation. Look down with me to verse 21 of chapter 7. Uh, we'll start verse 20, 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Listen, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in to the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
There's people that's called preachers who are going to die and go to hell. And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done not many wonderful works. And Jesus said then, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's Bible. There's a lot of people says, Lord, Lord, that have, that are really in essence never been saved. And that's the reason they've never been able to live a Christian life is because they don't have the foundation to build upon. How many of it does that make sense? It's got to be built on Christ. Stand with me. And we'll continue this series. I'm glad you listened real good today. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask you a question. Is there enough proof tonight if you died? How many are 100% sure that if you died tonight, heads bowed, eyes closed, you're not trusting church membership, you're not trusting being a Baptist, you're, you're just, you know you've trusted Christ. Raise your hand high. Hold them up a moment. Thank you. If you're here tonight and you don't know for sure and you say, Preacher Smith, I want you to pray for me. Maybe you're here tonight and you're living a very inconsistent Christian life and you just don't understand why you can't live a Christian life. Could it be that you never really trusted Christ? You're in and sin and back in and out and in and sin and you've never really been able to defeat sin because you don't really have not been saved. Anybody here tonight just not sure you're saved, not saved, just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I don't want to be fooled, preacher. I don't want, I don't want to go to hell. Thank you. Our Father, Lord, as we do the invitation, I think everybody's been saved. They say they have. But Lord, if there's one not sure, I pray they'll come. And we pray in Jesus' name.